102. And unless somebody speaks up, there are no adjustments to the agenda. Um, move to the consent agenda. Move the minutes of Tuesday, March 21st, 2023. Entertain a motion. Um, I'll motion to approve the minutes <coughs> of March 21st, 2023. Second. Um, all in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, do we have any <coughs> public comments at this time? Do we have any board comments? <clears throat> um, I just, um, I, I had two things. One, I just wanted to have a uh, shout out to the middle school softball coach. He put a lot of hard, hard work and time down at the field here. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the field down here, but it's basically ingrown grass turf. Um, so him and a bunch of volunteers this weekend, they were able to hit a rototiller and, and put a lot of their <coughs> time um, down there um, to make that field look good. So, um, it does look great. I noticed it when I drove by. Just wanted to give him and others some kudos on that. And then, Is that the Jeff? Yeah, Jeff. Jeff and, um, and then the Bowmans and the Bowmans. Uh, 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 can't remember. Um, Lisa Flint's husband. Um, loan them to the rototiller and tractor. Um, so yeah, worked out really well. It's good. Uh, and then I, I guess I was gonna bugger up the uh, agenda, but I had asked um, to put a an athletics and arts discussion on on the agenda item. I see it got put in there for future um, future consideration. I think. You know, just a, a little tidbit of that is really, I was kind of thinking about that we have, we have a really good roadmap and template of, you know, how we go about doing academics with our schools, but I don't think we've ever sat down to see, you know, how do we run our athletics department or how do we run our arts and music department um, so that all campuses kind of work together with those and, and not just the, um, what we call the in-school sports or in-school arts, but you know, the out of school pieces, the, the uh, spring soccers and the AUs and the uh, Chandler Halls and, you know, all the different pieces and how we can come together maybe to design a template that we can work with. Um, you know, like an example right now is we have, you know, let's, uh, let's say basketball, you know, um, the, the students in pre K up to fifth grade, they do Bethel U sports. So that's a completely different identity. Um, and then once they get to middle school, it becomes, you know, more in-school um, related. So often there might be kids that maybe don't have the appropriate skills for their age group um, um, or things like that. Or, or how can we best in the in-between seasons uh, accommodate everybody's schedule the best that we can with scheduling in-school um, season sports and maybe, you know, AU or something like that. Um, the other thing was kind of neat that neat that it's starting to gain traction here is that we have several AU teams, um, but we all have different names. <laughs> so, you know, instead of going to a school where they say, you know, we're all Blue Steel or something, you know, instead we have, you know, we have uh, Wildcat Basketball and we have Lady Wolves and, you know, so we have several different things. So just kind of like, let's figure out a road map, what that looks like. I also think that if we do develop something like that, it'll help us when we go to the voters about possible extensions for arts and music department. You know, if we have, you know, this this is where we want to get to. It makes it easier to pass a three or four million dollar bond vote on something like that. So, uh, so hopefully in uh, in May we can talk a little more on that. Uh. Thanks. Uh, any other board comments? I'll move to the celebration of learning. Community school partnership. Hey, hi. I'm Mary Schell, and I'm the community school coordinator, and I am so happy to be here. Um, I've worked for um, the district for a year, and I, or the supervisory union, and I haven't had an opportunity to share with you um, what the goals are of the grant, the community school grant, or my role in facilitating 
the grant. So I'm happy to be here to share that with you. Um, I have a PowerPoint, but I also have um, handouts that I'll just pass out to you here. Um, what I tried to do is do a crosswalk of the community school pillars and goals with the um, strategic action plan uh, action steps. And what I think is super <coughs> exciting, I'm not sure how many have to go down. Um, what I think is super exciting is that um, the White River Valley Supervisory Union is indeed a community school. Two more? You've got them. Yeah, you guys are more. You sure? Yeah. I think we're all set. Um, and um, in looking at the strategic action plan and looking at what I'll introduce um, to you as the five pillars of community school. Everything in the strategic action plan fits in the five pillars of um, the community school model. So the community school model is something that has been established in a number of states and Vermont with the passage of the Community School Act in 2021 wanted to create their own model of community schools. Nationally, the community school model has four pillars. In Vermont, we have five. So I'll go through what we're doing um, and how it fits under those five model, uh, five pillars. So in 2021, the White River Valley Supervisory Union received a three-year grant, one of five um, schools, I'll say, in Vermont and the only supervisory union that received it. So we're learning as community school coordinators what it means to be a community school in Vermont. Vermont um, gave, it, it, through this Act 67, the legislature gave different amounts of money based on the proposal that was, that was submitted. Our proposal primarily focused on the White River Valley Middle School in year one. Right now we're in year two, and it's expanding to include the high school. And next year, many of the grants, <coughs> um, goals and strategies apply to the whole supervisory union. So sometimes I'll be talking about the high school or the middle school or the whole supervisory union. And I hope you'll just bear with me. And in this packet, it goes through each of the strategies and it's more, it, it'll be clearer in terms of the actions um, that we're taking and if it applies to the high school, the middle school, the supervisory union. Okay, so I just want to clarify that a bit. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, what's a community school? A community school is both a place and a set of partnerships between the school and the community. Community schools have an integrated focus on academics, health, and social services youth and community development, and community engagement. Community schools emphasize real-world learning and community problem solving, and this approach leads to improved student learning, stronger families, and healthier communities. And I think we all know that, right? That's why we're here. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ray. Moving on. Okay, the first pillar is integrated student supports. Um, when I think this is a helpful diagram as well, and it gives a, a little bit um, of additional information pertaining to each pillar. So this is considered the first pillar of um, integrated student supports, where as a school we're thinking about mental and physical health services <clears throat> and that support student success, and um, how we do it and how we've been doing it through the community school grant is to focus on restorative justice and restorative practices, um, and um, also, I don't know if you can, um, let's see, there's something in red there. Ray, can you, I don't know if you want to click on that or if that would take you to a different place, <coughs> if you don't mind. Oh, that's not the right place. I'm sorry, let's go back. <laughs> and so that isn't linked. Well, um, that should have linked to our White River Valley High School Food Pantry. 
So we have a food pantry that we're establishing at the high school. Students brought the need forward to um, Dana Decker and Earl <coughs> Clinton and um, created a food pantry that, is, that students are accessing. And there's um, a write-up, I think it's probably in the principal's report as well, on the food pantry. So that's a really, um, I think, exciting example that then hopefully will be replicated elsewhere in the SU. Students are coming to school um, expressing that on the weekends they haven't had access to food at home, et cetera. So um, this is an effort where Dana Decker has been um, working with the local um, food pantry and establishing an in-house pantry at the high school that students have been able to access. They've also been, students been creating meals and giving them to others who need um, meals or, or, or just have that security. <coughs> So um, we're also, um, with that first pillar, we're um, doing professional development on restorative practices. And we had a Bethel University class where we were able to communicate to parents what the restorative practices approach um, is and using circles as they're happening at the middle school level in particular. OK. Uh, next one, expanded and enriched learning. Um, thank you, Rick. So this is a focus on student self-directed learning in terms of the grant strategies. Uh, we've been um, focused a lot on developing our flexible pathways programs both here at the middle school and at the high school. Uh, Andy West has developed quite a rich flexible pathways program and um, has included a number of community partners and um, individualized activities that students, learning activities are doing, um, that students are doing in flexible pathways. Um, he, cre he gave me a whole list of just what's going on um, just in this um, latest marking period. And he has students working in the elementary rooms, reading to students. He's partnering with Regeneration Corps, planting microgreens in the school greenhouse. Uh, students are doing Duolingo, Duolingo and Code Monkey. They're, they've established a weekly school store, and that's been super popular because the students are doing all of the purchasing and planning for that. Um, and yes, yeah, students have been making maple syrup two to three days a week with Bana in outdoor education. Um, and he has a he has a number of community partners coming in talking to the kids about what they do in the community. He's had physical therapists in. He's had um, some other uh, like virtual interviews with people that are working so he can provide students with the um, understanding of different jobs that are out there. And he also had food pantry folks come <coughs> in this week and they're going to have a dinner to um, support the food pantry on May 4th. And so you'll be hearing more about that. OK. I think we, oh, uh, the big one. I'm sorry. Um, with the link there, the after school club, Ray, do you mind clicking on that one? Yeah. We have lots and lots of after school clubs. And in this PowerPoint, that's also on the website. So if you go to the WRVSU website, you click on schools, you go to the far right, you'll see a number of links for community schools. This is linked there as well. We have lots of clubs that have been established. And um, if we, yeah, um, let's see. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, in the middle school, we started clubs in October. We off, we've offered uh, 19 different clubs. Um, last year, when I suggested, because I knew a lot of the community schools were, were creating after-school programs, um, it was suggested to me that our middle school students would not access clubs because um, there was an assumption that all students were involved with sports. Well, 21 to 24 percent, 23 or 24 percent of our students every month are engaged in clubs. Um, so that equals a little bit over 200 hours uh, every month of club activities that are going on. We have um, an additional 10% of our middle school students that are involved with the success club. So those are athletes that are finding time um, really helpful after school to focus on their academics as well as keep up with the demands of the schedule that athletes have. Uh, we have a number of clubs that are co-led or led by uh, community partners. So these are parents or people in the community that wanted to help out. 
um, and the grant has been able to provide stipends for that. And I'll talk about Tri-Valley Bus um, after, but 41% of all of our club participants take the Tri-Valley Bus. So that's pretty exciting. Okay, thank you. Now I'm done with the clubs. <laughs> um, and we can, if you don't mind going <coughs> taking a step back there, thank you. Um, we have also had the ability last year to have Tycho Drumming, an artist residency. This, this year we'll see what, what's going to um, happen with our artist residency, but we hope we will have an artist residency. We've been able to um, also invest in um, 25 bikes and a bike trailer that will be used both at the high school and the middle school. <coughs> We're also building a uh, rock climbing structure um, at the high school. So Jim Hewitt's just over the moon happy. There's lots of good stuff that he's helped to facilitate, <laughs> things that he's been working on and, and um, gathering support for. Um, we have had adventure days at the high school and the middle school where students are going bowling and skiing and fishing and skating and we've been able to provide for that through the grant. Um, we have uh, a couple of summer programs. We have a paddling camp that we did last year. We're going to do again this year, um, this summer. Um, we're <coughs> connecting kids in the, in the greenhouse and the, at the high school we're also building a greenhouse as well. So. We have so much great stuff going on. And I could keep going on and on, but I'm going to stop because I know I don't have a lot of time. So, Ray, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, a, uh, another important pillar is the active family and community engagement um, pillar of community schools. Our goal is to increase the engagement of families and community partners in school-related activities, meetings, and events. I'm sure you're well aware of the community conversation calendar that we've had across the SU on different topics, including um, math and mindfulness and wellness and clubs. And so um, that's been a, a way that I hope we're going to start um, opening up that pathway of, t of families and community members coming and um, learning about flexible pathways and all the other um, activities that we have going on. Um, next year we hope that every school will be hosting their own. Okay. Uh, let's see. We offered um, 15 Bethel University classes here at the school this year in March and we also um, had five of them co-taught with students and teachers here from the middle school. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm trying to think what else I want to highlight here. Uh, we have so many community partners that um, we're finding that our relationship with them um, is, is we're all facing very similar needs and a desire to connect. There, let's say there's a teacher that wants to connect with a, an engineer in the community but doesn't know one. It would require us to do individual research to find out who that engineer is that can come in and speak to a class, for example. So what we're working on is, um, I think we're going to go with a local wiki where we're going to try to create a directory that's crowdsourced where all of our community partners that have this desire to network and have a collective impact um, can join together and populate this resource. So we had a Bethel University class on it. Um, the goal is to map our assets and have a means where we can all connect. So hopefully in the next year that will be a resource not only for community members but also teachers that might need that one person to come in and, and, and um, you know, meet with their students. Uh, let's see. So I think that's a big piece. Um, the next one would be great, right? Uh, I like to think of community schools as um, addressing expanded learning opportunities through um, active family engagement, um, integrated support so all students have access to the classroom. And how we make that happen is through a collaborative leadership practice. So with that collaborative leadership practice, the goal is to have as many stakeholders sitting at the table as possible in order to make decisions about school, about how we do education, how all kids can access um, the classroom and provide expanded opportunities. Um, with the collaborative leadership 
practice is that addresses the role of a community school coordinator. Um, it also includes um, stakeholders like the Department of Education. Uh, Jess DeCarolis is coming to visit with us on May 19th. She's taken, and she's from the Agency of Education. She's our main contact at the AOE, and she's taken a great interest in the work that we're doing here at the supervisory union level. Um, she's working on logic models for all of the five community schools, and she's intrigued by ours in particular and wants to think about how to create this statewide model for community schools looking at what we're doing and trying to scale some of the work we're doing in that way. So that, I'm really excited about that. And, and we have monthly meetings with the AOE. I have them in terms of a cohort group as well as um, community school coordinator trainings, and then we have our quarterly check-ins. Um, collaborative leadership and practices, one of the main pieces that I think is standing out in our work that's catching the agency's attention is our positioning of students at the center of what we're doing. We're embarking on a portrait of a graduate um, effort where we're identifying um, you know, what it means to be a graduate of White River Valley Supervisory Union, and we're putting students at the center. Uh, Michaela Martin gathered students together with the help of Up for Learning, and students are being empowered not only to facilitate conversations, but to collect data from as many stakeholders in the community as possible in order to inform our process. So we're positioning students at the center of their learning and at the center of decision making and what it means to be a community school. And I'm super excited about it. So there's more to come on that. <laughs> and lastly, safe, inclusive, and equitable learning environments. So our strategies around equity includes, and this is really um, the lens of how we do everything. Every decisions, decision that we make, whether it's in the um, strategic plan or whether it's in um, decisions about programming, we have to make sure it's equitable. So as soon as the, for example, as soon as the idea of clubs came up, we needed to think we couldn't just offer clubs and expect all families to be able to get here at 4.30 to get their kids. So gratefully, Mike Reeder with um, Tri-Valley Transit has met with us and we were able to establish a bus stop here at 4.30 that could serve club members and athletes and bring them to South Royalton. So that enabled access to after school clubs to kids that might not have been able to access our programming at all. So we have 41% of our after school club participants that take the bus. So it's just so fun to see them get on the bus and talk to the bus driver and just feel really comfortable with public transportation. So that's this extra really cool piece. We, so the board knows we'll have late buses at the high school level that will be able to bring kids not only to our Bethel campus, but bring students um, on late buses to many of our sending choice schools throughout the SU. Like it's going to go to Rochester at like 5.30 at night and things so that students who may want to stay after school for extra support or an activity can and then hopefully access that public transportation to get home. Okay. We also have been doing school-wide reads. Uh, the la I'm sorry, Ray, you got ahead of me. Um, the book there, Dress Coded, is the book that's the middle school school-wide read. This year, the Newton School, as well as um, Chelsea, are also reading that book. And we have the author coming to visit. The author will be having an assembly and a workshop here on May 4th and at Chelsea on May 3rd. So um, if you'd like a copy of the book and if you'd like to read the book along with us, um, you'd be more than welcome to join us and we're looking forward to that. Uh, let's see. Can I just um, piggyback on that for a second? Yes, please. I know that um, Bethel Library is getting involved in that too and is hoping that some of the students will come to the reading group that's, do that's reading the book through the library too. Yep, exactly. And we're going to be doing that um, on May 24th. Okay. So thank you for reminding me to share that. Uh, let's see. I think that's the highlights. I left out that we are a generator school. We were identified as one of the eight schools in Vermont to set up a maker space here at White River Valley Middle School in order to um, provide students with opportunities to get some of the skills necessary 
to join into fields and manufacturing and technical skill areas, learning um, different ways to use um, manufacturing machines and 3D printers and things like that, and primarily the software that will then enable them to move on and use CAD and, and different things at the high school too. So, with that said, um, I think we could move on to the next slide, Ray, where I just want to share, and, and this is a slide I just added from another um, slide deck that I had, because I think it's so important for, for us to be aware of how significant this community school movement is. Community schools started just as places where um, families and students could gain access to health and social services, and then it the model has evolved to include not only um, those support services, but also strategies to enrich learning. And in Vermont, we see community schools as being the umbrella for Act 77 and proficiency-based learning, expanded learning opportunities, flexible pathways, et cetera. But the big piece with Vermont and why Vermont has five pillars and not four is this equity piece that in Vermont we know how important it is for all students to be able to have equal access to their education in a, um, play, in a way that um, enables them to learn in safe environments and equitable environments. And this last piece that's, that's there that I think I just put at the end of my emails because I think it's so powerful is that our state legislature has made a statement that every child should be able to grow up with the <coughs> opportunity to achieve their dreams and contribute to the well-being of society. Our public schools must be designed and equipped to fully deliver on that promise. So thank you for letting me share and um, I'd love to continue a conversation at any time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That was really great to hear and it's great to see the good work that's going on. Um, <coughs> does anybody have any questions for Mary? Um, one thing I think would be good to have a conversation about is this is a three-year grant and we're in year two. So, you know, looking at how do we make these things sustainable so that once the grant is finished, like, what do we need to continue and, yeah. Yeah. We're, sort of we're starting those conversations. Right. For example, um, a big thing for uh, uh, us, I think, is like, one, we've tried to use it for a lot of one-time investments for some supplies, but things like clubs, we are, the timing is ripe that 21 Century grants up for renewal. And so we've already contacted the agency to say that we want to expand middle school programming within the One Planet program mm -hmm. and probably model it after the club um, idea because it's taken off so well. Um, so we're debt, and there is interest at the agency level around making certain we have a strong sustainability plan and even possibly um, recognizing that we may need some additional funding past three years just to make certain that we're fully whole around sustainability that they may actually grant us another two additional years to just help with some things that weren't one-time cost okay. so but yes no we should continue that conversation and that's why in the crosswalk here I highlighted the action steps from the strategic plan that are the same as what we've been accomplishing with the grant. Right. And so I think once I go back and kind of cross-reference it, we'll see what isn't sustainable in terms of what's extraneous to what's already been identified through our action plan, I think. I don't know, it's a... Right. Yeah, but I guess it's more you know, what have we been paying for with the grant that we need to continue paying for mm -hmm. and then either finding other sources mm -hmm. or like the, the clubs right now are the big piece. Yeah. And that's stipends for the Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, the nice thing with like Tri Valley Transit, <clears throat> which has been a huge addition that we've been able to bring on from the community schools grant, um, but it's it's we're leveraging public transportation, so we're able to do all of our transporting right now for under $5,000 a year, um, which is pretty great. So I think, you know, in general, there's been a lot of, like, one-time purchases, like bikes and trail, like that trail, like, those are big items that we wouldn't have been able to necessarily do 
Um, but it's not like we've brought on a bunch of personnel other than Mary um, or things like that. Really, it's the after school clubs that we've been paying for the personnel piece. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I look forward to continuing the conversation. Great. Jamie. Now, so you have my report in hand, and Mary, I, I did highlight your website actually for them. Oh, so I did provide them a link if they wanted to connect on it. Um, and so it's been really great uh, working closely with Mary, with Owen being out. Uh, Mary and I have been meeting weekly um, to just make certain we're staying on track with the grant. And I've been attending the agency uh, check-in meetings as well, which has been terrific. Um, the other uh, thing that Mary mentioned that I just wanted to highlight that boards will be involved in is that <coughs> portrait of a graduate work. And my goal would be that um, we look at possibly leveraging some August retreat time to engage with the group um, that is starting that work with the board um, to really talk about what is it that we want our graduates to, to be able to really convey when they leave. Um, and we're going about it as WRBSU portrait of a graduate to really emphasize this interdependence across the SU and the idea being that no matter where you may leave at a school level here in the SU, that, it sh that we want to be vertically aligned and tracking toward the idea of graduating here at 12th grade. Um, and so, um, I think that that's going to be a powerful thing for us to really look to bring some more cohesiveness across our schools um, is through that lens of thinking about ourselves as if I leave a school at the end of sixth grade, well, what is it that I need to have for skills to be able to be ready to do my next chapter? It's not just about 12th grade. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight that. And then finally, quick legislative updates. Um, I talked about it at the full board yesterday. Um, the big one, that I think, in re two big ones for uh, the White River Unified District right now is one, and an email that I think you all should have received from the VSPA, I, I believe, today, or if not, you'll get it tomorrow, it are some talking points around the bill um, H486. Did I get that one right this time? Yeah, the, uh, yeah I saw the it. PCB today. bill. Yeah. Um, uh, the House um, is looking... Um, they proposed a bill that would uh, pause PCB testing for a more comprehensive deferred maintenance bill for Vermont schools. Um, the House Ed Committee had done a lot of work at studying uh, Rhode Island public schools and how they were able to fund <coughs> infrastructure um, capital improvements to offset deferred maintenance in their state. Um, and so the thought process is that we should be looking at how are we going to fund if we have multiple schools in the state all of a sudden come with increased levels of PCBs? Um, right now there's a little funding set aside, but certainly uh, not enough if multiple schools started to have um, heightened levels. I think there's also a desire to look at the research some more to see is the benchmark set at Vermont the appropriate benchmark for PCBs or was it set too low? Um, versus national standards. We are the only state right now doing school PCB testing. Uh, so we are sort of the uh, guinea pigs in this. Um, and, um, and so that bills into the Senate. So what it does is it calls for a pause in a more comprehensive plan around how to not only deal with PCBs, but deal with deferred maintenance in Vermont schools in general. So that, that is in the Senate right now. Um, and uh, there's an ex expectation that the Senate is going to make, is going to decide whether they're going to move forward with that proposed bill or not by the end of the week. <coughs> so that's one. The other one is the pre-K bill, um, which is in the House ad. The Senate essentially called for a study committee, and that was about it in their bill. Um, and there's a possibility that the House could possibly look at increasing um, what we currently get right now for uh, our students in pre-K is a 0.46, even though we educate them all day. We don't get a 1.0 average daily membership. Um, we know that early ed's important. I don't hear anyone in my players saying that it's not important. I think we can all agree on that. The idea that it costs 
that much less to educate a pre-K student <coughs> makes zero sense. Um, <coughs> and we know that early intervention is important. So I'll, uh, I'm certainly continuing to argue that if, if we're educating our students five days a week, full day, that we should get credit for them as a 1.0. Um, and so I'm hopeful that there's going to be uh, further work at the House Ed Committee to um, amend that bill to include that. I know the House Ed does have a desire to add that language to the bill. So those are the big ones right now. The other one that went over to the Senate, um, which wouldn't have a direct effect on us, was, uh, of course, the bill around uh, religiously uh, affiliated schools around Carson v. Macon, but really about how public dollars go to private um, independent schools. And um, I had kind of, I, I don't know if folks could pick up on it, my sense is when that House bill went over to the Senate, that it was probably just going to lay there, and my sense is that it's going to lay there. Uh, I heard it's kind of dead yeah. on arrival. Yeah. So that's that's where that bill is. And I'll um, entertain any questions folks may have. The PCBs, <clears throat> they said they've tested for those already. No. No. So it's a five-year testing plan right now. And so your schools have actually been tested. No, well, that's what I'm saying. Our schools have been. Where can we find out? what those results are? Uh, they are posted probably somewhere on the Department of Health okay. website. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't tell you exactly where, okay. um, but we were not close to the threshold, thank goodness. We're, so we're, we're clear, good. we're good. Yeah. Okay. We're we're good. My, that was my question because... No, no, said, we're good. You would know it, if there was It's an going issue. to Senate and it looks really good, but it's like in the meantime, yeah. if we what had is our issue, PCB level? Well, and here's the concern, right? So the way this works is if we were elevated, um, the Department of Health and Human Service Department immediately would be meeting with us and saying you have to you take have to immediate something. action. And so we would be sending letters out to the community and things notifying them of this. Yet, there's no action plan of how to actually abate this. And we are already tested and we're maintained at a better standard because they're wondering if they w want to loosen up the yeah. So these two buildings are So good. these two buildings are actually above the standard that is yes. already in place. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> My interest, though, is that I have other buildings. <coughs> of, oh, right? of course, and of course. So, but but I, this is our board, yeah, so I'm asking yeah, yeah. our buildings so are... So why I was saying it the way it was. Yeah. But I also have interest in all Vermont schools. And what, and what folks need to remember is there, there's no funding mechanism to deal with this other than the money they've set aside at the Ed Fund. Mm -hmm. So any time that they directly tap the Ed Fund it is going to affect our budget. Yeah. Change the yield. Yeah. Meaning it changes the tax rate. Well, it's, and that is horrible, but PCB. <laughs> well, I, th I, I think that part Just of what they, sure. yeah, no, what, part of what, what I think they're saying is, is that everyone agrees that we should be concerned with PCBs, yeah. but there should be an actual plan of how to deal with it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Jamie. Um, Principal report. So you have a report. I think Jeff is online, uh, and Principal Bradley was at six today. Uh, I would just highlight for the elementary. We're still doing what we're doing every week. Every week, every month, we celebrate and learn about a different character trait. This month, we're on positivity. Next month is courage. Uh, we've welcomed back on the Bethel campus Kara Hemingway from her maternity leave. Kids were so happy to see her. We're happy to have her back. She's been missed. Uh, most recently had our community uh, books and bagels community builder, which is always fun for kids to sit and gather in the stage groups and just, just commune together and eat and look at books. Always feels good. Um, and then I would say I just try to put some pictures in of the elementary, see a little bit of what, what it looks like when I walk around. Although right now if you walk around, there's actually chickens in a pool. <laughs> Chicks in a pool and Rebecca Ford's room are egg <coughs> uh, And some of these are just the highlights because April's a little heavy with testing. So we've been doing a lot of testing this month. So April showers bring May flowers, but April testing brings you May data reports. So <laughs> know that's what's coming. <laughs> um, and then finally, Angela Smith has been doing a really lovely job in, the, in our whole red school, but I, I'm feeling it in the elementary, of working on diversity and um, 
leading some staff meetings, but most recently brought in guest readers from Vermont Student Anti-Racism Network, which is just really lovely to read the proudest blue um, that happened on the Bethel campus. So connecting with our greater, broader community. So that's a little taste from the elementary. And I don't know, if, there he is. Yes, so for the high school, some highlights for the high school would be uh, uh, Minibeth came over to our faculty meeting to discuss the Track My Progress data results for the 8th graders to compare our high school um, staff to identify needs. Um, one of the nice flexible pathways transition that's going on in the PLC is one of our students is writing a cookbook. Uh, five students recently just uh, passed their uh, driving permits. Um, we have, for the community outreach, we just had student-led conferences last week, um, which has allowed our teachers to be able to support students in their personal pathways. And so it was great to have uh, a lot of the parents and uh, community into our school. We recently had a New York trip with our uh, music program, the Art and Soul Night. If you missed it, what a great evening of uh, community, having so many uh, different Community members into our school was outstanding. We had a blood drive recently where we uh, had donated 39 pints of blood. Our dream program is as strong as ever. We just had a mini graduation with the kids, which is a mentoring program. And the last thing is tonight we had 30 families come to our We Are Wildcat night for our recruiting. And uh, we had a lot of different families from uh, different schools that were here, which was really exciting from Stratford. Um, we had uh, Chelsea students, Tunbridge students, so we're doing some things right. So it was a great evening. All right, thank you. <coughs> Do you have any questions for the students? <coughs> All right, thanks. Um, Tara? Good evening, everyone. Sorry, uh, just got connected. So on my report for the month of April, it just outlines what's happening in the business office and all of the due dates for the reporting that we have, closing out third quarter um, and gearing up for the close of the fiscal year. And then two big projects that we've been working on end of March, end of April, is transferring the supervisory union financial software from uh, the old system that we were using into the same system that we are utilizing for all of the districts. And then um, Lisa and Christy and the rest of the business office team worked on reworking the onboarding process for new hires and trying to make that more efficient and having less need for multiple meetings throughout the onboarding process and really trying to solidify a more, more efficient and smooth flowing process and then if there's any questions thanks Tara um, on to the policy committee the board civility and code of ethics meeting <coughs> Ronnie you want to touch base on this uh, is this the adjusted well, this is not the adjuster from last no, because this would have went out in your actual packet. So there were some adjustments okay. made last night. So, so working on the board member civility, uh, it's pretty much copied from the this book, the central book. Uh, we are making some adjustments to it. Do you have notes on that? I don't. Yeah, yeah essentially, uh, the policy committee, you've got the one that you have in hand, but the policy committee was presented last night with some feedback um, from members that um, to really strengthen us that we would um, say that board members shall um, act within the scope of their official role, um, act within the scope of their fiduciary role um, to just strengthen them a little bit. And then there was some other edits in regards to um, the process around a complaint to just make it a little clearer. Um, you changed how to will for shall is what you're saying. The word, the previous word that was being used is will, and now we're using shall. No, it says board members agree to conduct agree themselves. To. Okay. And it says board members shall shall conduct. Yeah. Okay. Um, so with the uh, changes to the <coughs> process, 
Like this is kind of like pulled from the. Um, it's very. It's pretty much pulled from the policy we have around conflict, interest, conflict yeah. of interest. So, did, were the edits made to kind of make it not as specific to conflict of interest? Because like, you know, the, um, like one of the things is that uh, it's asking the person to recuse themselves from the issue, which isn't really a ethics thing. It's, That's you know, I mean, not it, what it was actually ethics. brought up. That was no, not. Didn't really talk about that. No, it wasn't about recusing themselves. It was more about that the person making the claim would need to specify within this policy what area the board member violated. Right. Um, yeah. So I mean, I guess like if it is a, you know, some of these things are kind of conflict of interest type things, but other parts are like the civility type things. Um, so, you know, in the the thing that's in this packet, they they have things like um, you know some of the, the steps or recourse by the board would be like ask the person to resign or something like that. You know, like it seems like having kind of specific recourses to specific a certain recourse for a certain violation. Yeah, not so much that, but you know this seemed to be very much the same as the conflict of interest thing where it's, it's there's this specific problem or specific issue that this person has a conflict with whereas this generally I think is more this person's behavior is out of line but it's not necessarily tied to a specific thing so what do you do when somebody's behavior is out of line and what are the recourses in that case really all we can do is censor right but I, I think it, that's what we should put in there is like we will censor we will you know shouldn't that be a procedure right but i think that's kind of what this this is what it yeah. essentially is it lays it out um peggy bullet five on page two oh yeah no it's it's been fixed just not in your pdf copy And the, the header on that section is Complaints of Board Civility Code of Ethics. <clears throat> and number two covers both. It's just that 2C would be the only one that covers uh, a finding of uh, civility. Which one? 2C. 2C yeah. is the only one that would cover civility because it would either be a we feel you need to be censured or we do not, because censure is all or nothing. You're either being censured or you're not. So as it's written now, you know, 2C does address uh, civility, yeah. while 2A, B, and C address code of ethics issues. I'm just saying, as, as it's, that, that makes sense to me, that it could be left like that, and you just, you just wouldn't have, uh, uh, well, actually, A and C. It could be dismissed, or it could. Be, it just wouldn't have. You just wouldn't have some uh, somebody. It would be an automatic recusal, I guess, is what I'm saying. If if you're voting to censure yourself, because why would you? That, that's automatic recusal. So it, I really feel like it maybe does cover, because if you want to send me the yeah. more specific, um, I I couldn't find in the book exactly where it talked about the discipline piece. So. Oh. I had just the PDF <coughs> copy, but if you guys want to send it to me, I'm happy to sure. share that with the yeah, group. Yeah, I, I can. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah, because it's a little different that they have in, in the book here, because this one talks about, I guess it would depend on the severity of, of the misconduct, but this right. one here talked about, you know, that uh, upon the first one, that it would be, um, it would be, uh, uh, an informal discussion between the board chair and that individual on their conduct, and then, and, uh, and then it says after three documented instances, then they would start to take these other steps, which the three steps they had laid out in there was um, board level discussion of misconduct, including a possible vote to censor, uh, communication of misconduct to the community presented by the board members, so the board member issuing a apology or you know something like that 
And then the third, which would probably be on the most egregious pieces, would be where where the board would ask the individual for for them to resign. Yeah. And granted, they don't have to, but you know that would be something. Right. Those are the things that were laid out, I believe, that Roddy's looking for. Yeah. 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 And that, I, I like that approach in that there's kind of first you get yeah. a reminder. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's not like we go immediately to a public meeting. Well, I don't. Know. Well, I don't. Yeah, I, I think that's hard because this could be someone. <laughs> yeah, if it's a community member. Right. Yeah. Right. And I guess it depends. I mean, you know, there's, I guess there's going to be gray areas and everything, right? So. I mean, but I think if you have that, incident. I think if you have that procedure and somebody comes to you with a complaint, you can say, um, "We are taking the first step where we are telling the person to stop." this behavior continues, then we will take another Can you take send that step. to me in writing and I'll bring it, we can bring it to the committee? Sure. Yeah, I can find that. They seem, yeah, I mean, here somewhere. Yeah. they were, I think this group was, per, yeah, that would be important for me to bring forward to them, if that language. The, the so other thing I was thinking of is, you know, that there should be some sort of timeline as a response. And I think the one that we had gotten there last year, that um, I think a lot of the reasons why some people became angry was because they didn't think that we were moving quick enough. Um, even though it's challenging because we only meet once a month. Yeah. So so to you and I, we think that we were moving fast enough, but to, to the average person they thought that, you know, you know, it just so happened to be right right yeah, after the meeting, after, so it was yeah. like almost two full meetings and sure. you know, so would there be something in there about like um, you know, kinda like if there was a a misconduct uh, Thing at school, how usually there's so many hours or so many days um, that a follow-up would be, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think that is or, a little difficult. You could say that would be. Yeah. Okay. Well, just a board member conduct. Right. Yeah, right. This is what you want. Yeah. You know, so. you know, maybe you could put something in there. I know, you know, to make it more realistic for boards meeting once. I can month. photocopy it and email it to you. You know, maybe you bring it up. Yeah, so this is page know. 92. Right. And then the sample process is. That the so, complaint would be heard with some of them are on different pages of different books, depending on what year book you have. Now we could just photocopy this. 2020. <clears throat> Chris, if it played out the way that it did last time, though, it could still be almost 60 days. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, put yes, put it in writing. I agree with you, but it could still yeah. be it could still be a, a length of time that makes people <coughs> uncomfortable, unhappy. For us to get around to it, unless we unless we hold a special meeting, mm -hmm. and that would I would say that would be if somebody really uh, was have, yeah, yeah a real trans a real serious transgression to hold a special meeting just about that. <clears throat> but, and, and maybe maybe it becomes something like and maybe we put in there, you know, something within sixty days, and then when somebody says why sixty days, you can say well you know the the, the process in which mm -hmm. we meet is. If we have a meeting it's on a Tuesday and something yeah. happens on a Thursday, yeah. that's... Because at least yeah. you have something in there where an individual that makes a complaint um, can see that, you know, there would be action within so much time. They'll feel heard. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, the three things that this says the board can do, like the formal things, is the board level discussion of the misconduct, including a possible vote of censure, mm -hmm. communication of the misconduct to the community represented by the board member, mm -hmm. a formal request for that person's resignation from the board of directors. You're looking for just those tools to be added? Yes, I think so. And then, um, you know, I, I think that the having the chair or executive committee having some discretion is like I think the boards I, I don't mean to speak for but this was raised I think that there is a concern at least from certain board members of having that language in there it, it's what happens if the board chair is actually responsible for that behavior right and I think you can say you know if the complaint is against the board chair the vice chair would respond Know, that kind of thing like okay. but you know what I would be worried about is if you have somebody who just spams complaints and we have to hold a 
something at the that's what they were trying to do is bring forward that that there was there was more detail in the new model around you had to specify in writing and exactly what part of this policy was violated right but you know I, I what I like about this is that you can ask the person to stop you know like basically give the person a warning and then if they don't and then respond to the person who made the complaint saying we have warned the person about this behavior this is their first offense so <coughs> it continues you know this is for kind of minor offenses if there's something major you go straight to a meeting if it's something minor you say I, we agree this violated but you know it's a warning if it continues we will Escalated. You know, it kind of gives a bit more. If you can figure out, if you can put that in sure. writing, I'd appreciate it. Sure. I'll I, think, try. I think it, well, exactly. <laughs> I, guess this, uh, I can't remember <laughs> well, again what source it came from, but I can. The degree of severity is up to the board, though. I mean, that, that's where I think this gets really starts to get right. And yeah, because anything short of. I mean, I mean, I don't want to say anything short of criminal behavior, but we're, we're, we've been elected and. Ultimately, you know, you're censured. Okay, I'm I'm censured, or all of it, all the way through, is is got a certain level of right. But I think you know the board, as a whole, indicating what they think is appropriate behavior and what they think is not. Oh yes, no, no. I, I like setting the standard, but the we have to be careful that we don't overreach as well. <clears throat> all right. Uh, do we want to continue discussing this, or shall we move on? I think, uh, uh, I think we need to move on, right? Go Sounds good. Um, so yes, I'll, I'll try and send you No, it'd be stuff. great. If yes. anybody else has any suggestions, let's send them um, Policy adoption, I have to adopt the WRBSU special education policy. Um, this passed the full board last night. Um, and we had readings of it, so at this point I entertain a motion to adopt the WRBSU special education policy. Motion to adopt. Second. Okay. Do you have any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. We have adopted the WRB <coughs> special education policy. All right, so I'm moving on to discussion items. Um, the district building security and safety protocols discussion. So I know we had briefly started this discussion, I don't know, many months ago. Um, the, um, I believe at that time, uh, Jamie did. Can you say that the school had an assessment done or, or did have one or was getting an assessment that goes along with? Um, so I, I have brought in and done some assessments on certain yeah. school buildings. Uh, and prior to my tenure, Mark Moody had come, um, who was a consultant, and done assessments on all of our buildings. There was a couple other buildings that I brought him back to this current year and done some safety assessments. We have not done it on either of these two buildings, but we did do it just before COVID hit, was my understanding. Is that correct, Andrew? Yeah, I'm trying to actually find it, because I feel like it wasn't that long ago, but it probably was that long. Yeah, I think it was just before my tenure. So I think, you know, a part of putting this on there, well, one part is, you know, the, the things that continue to happen, unfortunately, at schools, um, and, uh, you know, at times, you know, children may not be as secure as we'd like them to be in certain instances. Um, the other piece to this is just, you know, so is the, you know, the structural piece, which as you can see, you know, just in this building, you know, we, we have upgrades that need to get done anyways, um, because you can literally see through the door. <laughs> um, so there's energy weather, weather type, you know, entry doors that need to be replaced. So while we're having to replace these, we should be talking about dual entry uh, points. So I mean, you know, uh, you know, now the old single entry pieces are now frowned upon as security um, slash um, energy efficient um, entryways. So you should have that just like at the high school when you walk in, you have a dual entry system uh, where you can either 
secure the outer door or you can secure the inner door. Um, and it also makes that transition of heat better when you're, you're, when you're going from outside to inside or vice versa. Um, and I know, I know unfortunately, you know, even if you walk through this library one, you'll, you'll see how that one uh, uh, goes together, which is an old, uh, an old uh, elbow of the door that uh, holds it closed. And, you know, the, the door on the back side of the gym, you know, there's a hole in it like that big. Um, and then your entry doors, you know, they're, they're not weatherproof, they're not soundproof. <coughs> I'm, I'm sure uh, Andrea hears it about a hundred times a day when somebody comes through that door now and goes, slam, and one of these times that glass is just going to come flying out of it. So um, so we're in need, and there's there's some um, there's some doors in the back side of the high school that have some of the same instances uh, that, that need to be done. So I, I guess I was trying to think of, we. It's kind of like the heating system, like we've taken quotes for years, but like it's time to get these things fixed. And, and we do have, you know, some money in our, our funds. I think it would be an appropriate time to maybe, uh, I was thinking on this portion of it, is maybe task the, the um, buildings um, committee and, and to seek out um, uh, these plans to, or proposals to, to have these done uh, because they need to get done anyways. Um, and then the second piece of it is, is the piece of, you know, um, I was looking through some um, some grant programs and some programs through the um, the DOJ and uh, there's a, a school violence prevention program that's out there that, that has uh, grant money um, about hiring uh, resource officers. Um, you know, and a good thing, I think a lot of us, when we went to school, we had resource officers at our, our schools in one fashion or another. Um, I mean, the, the first part is a resource officer is, you know, they're in the building for many different types of protection. It could be an outer threat, but it also could be um, a misbehaving physically child. Um, we do have those once in a while, like the lockdown drills. Um, the resource officers can also be trained to do do and help with a lot of different um, uh, issues that we deal with every day um, when it comes to, um, you know, violence prevention, drugs and alcohol abuse. Um, they can even help out. We see it a lot more now with like cybersecurity and some of the things that we are having to deal with, you know, phones and TikTok and all these things that we've been hearing about a lot that we've had to spend time on. So um, I was looking and they, they do have some three-year grants out there where they actually will pay for, they'll pay up to $125,000 a year per resource officer for three years. Um, so I just kind of going back to my days of, you know, the DARE programs and, and, and those things that you don't see anymore. Um, you know, we do, do or have had some, you know, drug and alcohol abuse type things on our campuses. And, and then, you know, it's kind of one of those things rather be proactive than reactive if something ever happened to one of our campuses. So um, the, the other thing I was looking through that, and maybe it gets covered, Jamie, on the, if you do a, uh, uh, a security assessment, but uh, they go through things or recommendations of things like um, um, time per incident. So how long would it take for somebody to get here? And if so, would they have the proper training to, to take care of things? So, um, now, I don't know. So, I mean, so those are, I guess, the, the questions that I have, and um, I think we can, um, we can, just on the, the building security, I think, I think we can um, take care of two things at once, just because we do need to do upgrades to our doors. Um, so maybe we can make those accesses secure. And, and I'm sure, Andra, you know, you go back and forth to both buildings, and both buildings have two different access um, pieces, right? Yeah, completely. So, you know, could we could we make it so that our campuses are similar? So, you know, your access would go to two buildings, or because we do have often people that go back and forth, and coaches and teachers and um, things like that. So, how, how we can make it easier? Uh, and, and then I think the other discussion would be is you know a resource officer, something that we'd like to see at our campuses. Do we have? one person that goes back and forth to campuses, maybe they're a few days a week in each campus, or do you have somebody every day, all day? Um, but uh, something, something for us to think about as a board, I think. Um, 
Yeah, thanks for those thoughts. Um, I would be curious to hear what the administration thoughts about resource officers in general would be, I guess. Um, I, yeah, I would need to think about it, I guess, but um, do you guys want to? Yeah, I guess I would just need a little time to like chew on it and think about how best to leverage it. And sure. And but I do think the entry doors are sort of a big deal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the entry doors. I think that's, that's something we could do right away. Yeah, that sounds uh, like a great <laughs> idea. Uh, they, they, these are, like I said, they're not weatherproof. They're not that good. They're, they're, they're all, they, they get time for an upgrade there. I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's out of the uh, scope of work of the gentleman that we work with for the, the HVAC systems, if, if they perform those types of duties too, but... You thought that would have been on the energy efficiency report, they did uh, long the lights and all that stuff. Yeah. They, they did talk it. about the entryway at one point way back when we started as uh, one of the IEM measures. I think we just didn't go that route just because of... Yeah, yeah, it was two years ago. And some other work <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't have as many reserves at that moment. Mm -hmm. um, but I do know that there was talk about a double entryway there. But I also agree that there's uh, one of my other concerns is, and it's something that I know that the architect at Royalton was going to be drawing up, was a lot of our high school students come in in the mornings not actually in the front entryway. They come in in the back. And how do we create a much more inviting and safer area there for them to access yeah. off their back yeah. parking lot? Kind of looks like a back alley back. <laughs> well, and it, it also doesn't have any double, you know, I think it's a similar issue. Um, I mean, we're also talking about doing that performance space upgrade, which would be that. Which would be that section. Yeah, that area. yeah no, I, and, I, and I had said to the architect that they should be drawing that up so mm -hmm. we could look at it. If we were going to do that area, it should also tackle that. I'd say it's fair to say at this point we should never draw anything new up without taking that into consideration. Yeah. The mm -hmm. double entryway ever. Yes, yeah, um, and that serves a dual purpose. Yep, yeah, it does. I think just kind of short term getting a camera on that door would be brilliant. Because we can't buzz kids in through that door, so that's no, why right. they all can't see them. Yeah. Yeah. Try to park in the other parking lot and well, then that should be a quick fix. That should be sooner rather than yeah, later, other right? than we... Yeah, other than I don't know how safe I feel like that is. Okay. Uh, has been my concern. That's been brought up to me. And okay. I do <clears> worry <throat> about there's no one actually laying eyes on, and the plus that we have right now in our entryway, at least here and at the high school is, mm -hmm. is that a physical person can lay eyes on. You can't have someone that you recognize a face and you just buzz them in, but there could be danger to the left-hand side of the door. Okay, yep, <clears throat> yep. I get it, but. The actual recommendations is you really get it away from these cameras that just someone's looking at a screen and you're buzzing in, that you set up your well, situation where you can see the well, whole person. I was gonna, gonna say, even a situational up. moving type thing. But I mean, we're going to have two accesses, so. You would need to just have cameras that can see the whole person, right? Like or wh or what we've talked about is if we redo that entryway, possibly there's an office space down there. Okay, but presumably you wouldn't have multiple people letting people in, though. The recommendations would yeah. do that. Yes. Or, I mean, if thinking outside the box, Jamie, the camera doesn't have to be position that I mean the camera could be positioned so that it's at the backs of the people at the door no. and you could see geez there's four people I, at the door I totally <coughs> hear you but okay. what I'm saying is, is based on the audit we just did right. on a building is yeah. that they okay. want that that they would say is that you want someone in a situation to lay their eyes on anyone you're actually allowing in okay that, that's why so if we were gonna do it right I'm just saying like that's the recommendation and that's why the dual entry is is the way to go it's just like a bank the outer door is always open if you want to go to the ATM, but the inner door is locked, right? And then there's cameras in the entryway to be able to see, you know, kind of a 360 view of who, who the individuals are that you're buzzing in, right? Now, now there's some issues with the current layout <laughs> to make it work, but... Um, yeah, um, well... So I would still say from a safety standpoint, I hear out of convenience it's easier to buzz people in the back way, mm. but I would 
feel better that they're still coming to the front door where our admin assistants are actually laying eyes on them. Right, but I mean, during we currently have, during the school day, sure. Yeah, yeah. We currently have kids entering through that entrance. Absolutely, and there's adults standing there at the start okay. of the day, so we're still Sorry. doing that. That wouldn't, Got it's me. not like it's locked in there. Yeah. Okay. And, and we have our next um, um, facility committee May 5th or 6th. No, it's four, May 8th. Eight, yeah, so that we, Monday. So we could, you know, I guess if that's something that the board wanted us to do, we could start um, talking about that and start, you know, get somebody to give us a quote on what what the work might entail and yeah. no, I maybe think we're that able sounds to do good. all of it or some of it or get pieces of it started. Or You know, it seems like we kind of have our summer work planned out and then we were kind of talking about that there would be a second round of upgrades like the... Some of those other things that were on the list, like if we could get this in, into that, or like the air and humidity pieces that we're right. talking about, yeah. So, you know, there was oh, all yeah. the stuff that didn't <coughs> pay, its, pay back for itself. You know, yeah. we kind of did all the stuff that right. we can do with the bond, mm -hmm. or not bond, but you know, I mean, performance like, contract, performance contract yeah. this mm -hmm. time. But we were there's still other stuff that needs to be done, which is not going to be sure. performance contract. Be, this would be one of those things. <laughs> So let's make sure that this gets into that. And then for, why don't you guys think it over? Um, about the resource officer? About the resource yep. officer and get back to us at uh, future board. I can send you the link to the yeah, USDMJ and the school violence prevention program. <clears throat> and speaking for myself, what I would like to hear is not like, I mean, partially it would be what would a resource officer look like, but also, you know, like, is this how we want, you know, if we have an extra $80,000 to have an extra staff person, like, is that the staff person we would want versus, you know, supporting the school in other ways or whatever. But in a, in a piggyback off of that, and this might just be my ignorance because I'm just joining, do we have an emergency management policy? Is it written? The staff has access to it, and did we? And, <clears throat> and uh, okay, Absolutely. and and do we coordinate with town and state yes. police to okay? Oh yeah, and okay. and that's sitting there. And have we ever run a drill? Yes. Uh, we do okay. Every month. every month we get a drill. Absolutely. Okay, so so we have We've some. We've evacuated to our office. I was going to say we places. have some. We have some idea of the time response time that we could we get from uh, the Bethel barracks or the town police or. Well. Well, it's excellent because they come here when it starts. But I mean, we always we I think always that think. The question that we have is the response time. We we, we always think, think we know, but we don't know. Right, right. right like right. so, an example I can give you is when the swatting calls were happening across the state, and we thank goodness we're not part of that. Yeah. There was forty to fifty cops arrived at Montpelier High School within, you know, less than a minute. Okay. And Randolph got two state police folks, and it took them over 15 minutes. That's a pretty big Well, spread. because they were all going to a different location. Right. <coughs> so I just, you could, again, ideally, I think we would have thought it was going to be a lot quicker response to Randolph. Right? Okay. That was my point. But yeah. Then it wasn't. Okay. Yeah. Because they were all headed in different directions that day. Okay. Are we uh, ready to move on from this discussion item? And we'll, um, can I, uh, I probably should have said this at the adjustment of the agenda, but would anybody mind swapping 9.2 and 9.3 so we can let Tara go after we deal with the audit? Mm -hmm. I'll do it. All right. Um, so why don't we discuss the audit at this point, the possible action? Um, Thank you, Andrew. So I sent you all the fiscal year 22 audit. Um, in that email was my memo outlining the highlights of the audit, um, plus the PowerPoint presentation that returning board members have seen every year about, as a board member, what you're looking for in the audit, um, and also for the new board members. I didn't receive any questions, so if there's any I can try and address tonight, I'm happy to do that. Otherwise, um, I can go over the management letter recommendations and then hopefully have acceptance of the audit. Does anybody have any questions no. for Tara? Mm -hmm. <coughs> All right, why don't you uh, do your summary? 
So the management letter recommendations are not a surprise. Um, they're the same findings that we had um, in fiscal year 22 as far as recommendations, sorry, not findings. Um, recommendations being that our bank reconciliations needed to be done within 30 days and then our general ledger reconciliations um, also needed to be done within 30 days of the close of the prior month. So as I explained at the full board and also through our discussion with our auditors is we are on task with that now, but when we lost our accountant midterm um, in fiscal year 22, that put us behind in getting our bank reconciliations and general ledger reconciliations done within 30 days. But they're all done now and we are completely up to date through the month of March. And then the biggest thing out of all audits is we actually had no findings. So that's always really exciting. Is this good news? Yeah. <laughs> it's very good news. All right. Well, thank you, Tara. Um, and thanks for all the work that you put in on the audit over the last many, many months. <laughs> um, yes, we've been in audit since last May. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, at this point, unless anybody have any questions, um, I would entertain a motion to approve the 21-22 fiscal audit for the White River Unified District. So moved. Seconded. Is that appropriate language? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? All in favor say aye. 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 <coughs> any opposed? Right. <coughs> the audit is accepted. Thanks, Tara. Thank you all very much. Have a good night. Thank you. All right, um, back to 9-2. Um, statement of support for the LGBTQIA community, uh, possible action. Um, this is something I asked to add to the agenda, so I'll let him speak to it. Uh, <clears throat> I know we had a, a previous statement that, uh, that didn't pass, and uh, I kind of wanted to get something that maybe could, so um, I sought out similarities in in certain statements that other school boards had made. Um, this one actually doesn't have my, my, my citation uh, because some of the uh, framing did come from the Fairfax, Virginia School Board uh, and their statement to, uh, to their constituency. But uh, I wanted to find something that maybe we could, we could approve and that was right, uh, right down the middle and, 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 and fairly approvable and that everybody could agree on. So if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to read it now. A statement of support for LGBTQIA plus students in WRUD. The White River Unified School Board understands that our LGBTQIA students, staff, and families are worried about the impact of recent proposed model policies for transgender and gender expansive students in other parts of the country. According to the Trevor Project, which conducted 2022's benchmark national survey of LGBTQ <clears throat> youth mental health, one in five transgender and non-binary youth attempted suicide in the last year. LGBTQIA plus youth who found their school to be affirming reported lower rates of attempting suicide by half. Only one in three transgender and non-binary youth found their own home to be gender affirming. It is necessary to ensure our school community is a place where all students can live without fear of prejudice, discrimination, harassment, or violence. Our policies and regulations will continue supporting our transgender and gender expansive students, staff, and families. White River Unified School Board policy protects students, educators, and other staff from discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. <clears throat> White River Unified District relies on robust parent-guardian engagement to help protect, provide transgender and gender expansive students with protections and supports. We will continue partnering with, partnering with parents and guardians because their involvement is necessary to student success. Furthermore, our school board is committed to following the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which was upheld for sexual orientation by the SCOTUS and any prohibition on gender identity or discrimination in 2022 with Judge Neil Gorshik providing the majority opinion and 16 VSA Statute 131, 
which requires acknowledgement and respect for students' gender identity in action and instruction as a component of community health, mental health, and human growth and development. Protecting, supporting, and affirming our transgender and gender expansive students is critical to achieving a safe and respectful learning environment for all students and providing them with equal access to educational programs, services, and activities. The work to do so in a holistically and inclusive way continues, but we know that from this commitment, we will not waver. We declare these eight principles will guide our work for the community benefit for all students that acknowledge some classes of student may be subject to additional stresses and need additional support from us. Respect, respect for the diversity of our students, staff, and community. Integrity, upholding the highest ethical standards in all of our activities. Accountability, taking responsibility for our decisions and actions. Transparency, openness and candor in our communication. Collaboration, working together to achieve our shared goals. Quality, providing excellent service to our constituents. Safety, ensuring the safety of our students and staff. And inclusivity, well, creating a welcoming and supportive environment for everyone. <clears throat> if anybody has any questions for me as to what I was thinking or where I was going with anything, I'm happy to speak. <clears throat> Thoughts on this statement of support? This moment. I mean, I think I just have to go back to prior comments um, that that I had um, back in November. Um, the um, I mean, we currently have policy C28, which is transgender and gender non-conforming student policy that um, that reaffirms the, the state um, statute. And we also have our newly um, conforming uh, declaration of inclusion um, statement that we have for the school. And I, I think, like, like I had said before, um, I understand that there are, there are different groups of students that we have in our schools that at time, um, you know, uh, at time need, need additional support, um, but we're not listing all those groups in this statement. And, and to, to add one group but not add other groups, I think would be unfair to students that are suffering for one, you know, for many different reasons. I, d I do like the, you know, I like the, the bottom part of it where, you know, you talk about the, you know, that we declare these eight principles will guide us in our work uh, for the community benefits of all students. And, you know, and I think, you know, putting together something that encompasses all students um, would, would be more inclusive. Um, you know, I've got to think of the students that, you know, think of all the students today that are dealing with something, students that come from households that maybe they came hungry, maybe they are abused, maybe they are dealing with a divorce or a, a parent that's not there or a death in the family. Um, students that deal with every day that we see with image issues, confidence issues, eating disorders, ADHD, substance abuse, uh, behavioral disorders you know, major depression, anxiety. I mean, there's, there's so many groups of students that do, don't have a statement, you know. You know so, how, again, providing one statement for one group but not for the other, I think, is, is doing us an injustice. But um, I, I had said before in November that I'd be more than willing to come up with a, a statement that supports all of our students equally. Um, and, and I would be and we're willing to work on that and, and to approve something like that. But to, to do it just for one group but not for the other groups, I, I, I can't. I think that um, it's hard for me to, to think of another group of kids that is under attack across our country the way this group of kids is under attack right now. Um, yeah, there are lots of kids with lots of problems. I agree with you, Chris, that, yeah, we do have kids with lots of problems, the socioeconomic ones that are the ones that get me the most. Um, but 
those kids aren't being attacked constantly in the news, uh, in states where they live, and there's no telling that this isn't going to happen in Vermont, too, that what's happening in other states, what is it, I think there's 13 states so far now that have passed legislation against this group of kids specifically. Um, it's kind of terrifying. And so that's why I would support this, um, just because this is the group that's being attacked. These are the kids that are feeling as though they're not welcome. Yeah. And I would say, you know, it is in our community in that if you look on public Facebook groups, you know, there's posts specifically saying, like, you know, trans, like, basically singling out transgender students, and there's no post saying, like, you know, anorexic students shouldn't be able to take part, and I, it's not to say that, you know, <coughs> it's, that's an issue as well, and those students need to be supported, but they're not being singled out currently, whereas this group is. So. Well, I mean, I know, I know back in November, you know, I'd, I'd asked for the data for our our campuses, um, which at that time there was two documented instances of um, bullying or harassment as a result of sexual orientation. And I think we all can agree that two is too many, right? Yes. Um, but it wasn't exactly what we would think it would be. It wasn't that both cases were directed towards LGBTQ kids. Um, there was, they were split. There was one that was against an LGBTQ person. There was one that was against a non-member. Um, and, and I agree with you that if you look in the news tonight and you know, you talk about other states, but you know, this is Vermont, this is Dutch. You know, not necessarily what's happening in another state is happening in this state. Vermont has always been on the forefront of equal rights for all people. Um, and if you go back and look, Vermont was the, I, I believe it was the 13th state that, that had, you know, civil rights um, pieces. So it's, Vermont's always been on the forefront of these things. Um, and, um, I, I mean, again, we... Um, May I? Yeah, let me just say one thing and then, then you can answer. Um, we just had the discussion about uh, security and safety protocols. If you look at our local district, you know, we haven't had any incidences. But looking nationally, it is a concern because you see data that's, you know, like incidents all the time that happen elsewhere. So, you know, in that case, you're willing to look more broadly and be proactive about communicating and working on solutions to something that hasn't happened here yet, but we don't want to have happen. And so I think in this case, like it's the same principle should apply. Um, anyway, go ahead. <coughs> so I, I did tailor this in hopes that everybody could just uh, agree that this was uh, good. But my thought, and I see what Chris is saying, but similar to the gun safety and such, just because it's not happening here doesn't mean we don't have to address it if it's happening nationally. We've got 13 states who are actually at a state level legislating against what we, what we legislate as correct in Vermont and going against a SCOTUS decision on gender identity for it being a civil right. They're actually legislating at a state level against the Supreme Court of the U.S. So what we've got is a case where we would be disingenuous not to address this and in doing so, in addressing it, we will remain at the forefront and we will remain the best in class state for civil rights and human rights and children's rights. So what we need to do is we need to address this so that we are continuing to be in the forefront of addressing it. And, and I think to, to not address it in some way for us is, is disingenuous because we need to make a statement of that we believe this and that this is where we're at so that when other states other school districts other supervisory unions look at us they see that we are the shining example of how to treat people in a community 
So that, that's that's all I'll say for now. And I wish it wasn't necessary. <laughs> Me too. I wish I wish that we didn't even have to discuss this. That, but I also I wasn't on the board at the time when the data was collected about there being two incidents that was reported back in November. Um, two incidents that are documented. I wonder how many incidents there are that have not been documented. Um, I know that a lot of kids are very leery of reporting things that have, have been said to them or have been done to them. If they had a statement like this, maybe they'd be more willing to come forward because they'd realize, okay, I've got some allies here. Or well, maybe, according to the Trevor Project, which is a, a acknowledged study and very respected, done in 2022, maybe a statement like this would keep just one of those kids from killing themselves because they felt left out as a trans or non-binary kid. And if this statement saves the life of one kid because they feel seen, then this piece of paper was worth me drafting up and bringing to you guys tonight if one kid doesn't kill himself or herself because they feel that they are seen. I'm sorry, I feel strongly about it. <clears throat> well, I think on my end of things, and I've said before, and, and you know, the, the sad thing with having discussions nowadays is um, just because you may not be in agreement of a statement of support doesn't mean that you're anti a group. Um, and it's very sad that we live in a society where um, if you are not directly in support, you're against, which is not correct. Um, and, um, and I could go into that more if I need to. But, you know, in this case, I have to look at my daughter every day. And my daughter was bullied and harassed in this school that wanted to take her own life. And we do not have a statement of support for her. And she was one of the two people, I, or two instances I mentioned. And I don't, I want to find something that is encompassing everybody. And we could put together a statement of support that includes all groups. But to just have one just to support, what does that tell the other kids? I mean, I want to save all kids. This support is saving one group of kids. What does that tell about the child that doesn't fit this group tonight, that is bullied and harassed, that wants to take their life? Is their life not just as equal as the next person's life? I mean, again, we got to thank all students and, and put together a statement. We could put together a really strong statement of support for all of our students and include different classifications of students. Um, Would that be covered by an anti-bullying policy, Chris? I mean, what you're saying, you're saying out loud right now is all students matter. And it's the same as sure. looping back to the, the Black Lives Matter discussion where we say, well, these lives are disproportionately affected by this stuff, so we're trying to support. It's, it's that disingenuous argument, and I don't want to uh, be in conflict with you, but like, all, stu all, all, argument that all, all students, students matter. matter. Give me a break. You're just throwing that out because you, this. It, no, I you know actually what? did the hey, SCOTUS. Hey, 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 no, I did the I SCOTUS. Have time, one time, I have to live with a teenage daughter that for the last six months, I've had to be to ER visits. I've had to wait uh, for mental health um, uh, counseling that is, isn't provided. Um, I guarantee your principals in the school can account for how many days she's left or not been in the school because I've had to deal with her mental health. And, and she was bullied and harassed by LGBTQ members. Okay? I'm not saying single out of group. I, am all, I have lots of friends that follow under LGBTQ. Lots of friends, lots of peers, lots of coworkers. But I'm saying it's not fair to do a statement for one group and not for all the groups. Okay. It, um, and then to say that all students don't matter, I'm not here on a political thing. Literally, all students do matter. Every student in the school matters, every single one. So what is, this, what is something we could add to this? Because I don't know what I would call another group that would get included in this. 
there must be a way of, of wording it so that. Well, I, I think we need to recognize that there are a lot of students that need a little extra help or right. guidance that do not actually fall into the LGBTQIA mm -hmm. head uh, members or whatever you want to call it. Um, I mean, it's, and that's true, there's, there's children of, like you said, divorced couples, whatever, that do need extra guidance. And right. I think we need some kind of statement that would we fully support. So maybe a, another paragraph could be included. We recognize that there are many students, many students who are <laughs> suffering um, from depression or whatever <clears throat> that are also in need of um, counseling or I can't think of the proper wording off the top of my head. Uh, but yeah, including another paragraph about that. Um, I think that the ending, though, these eight points, that, that does include all students. It literally says all students, if I may point that out, yeah. in, in the bold. So. Yeah, and I, I think the way that it's written, it's written in to say, because we want to support all students, we need to make sure we're supporting, you know, like, the overall goal is to provide support for everybody, you know? And this is just a specific thing because these this group is being, you know, publicly, like, is a current issue. This is our stance on this group specifically, but we want to support all kids. And I, I'm perfectly happy to, you know, if we want to add more or something like that, I think that'd be fine. I like the way that you started that off, that we want to support all of our students and then have a qualifier. But in this case, um, we understand blah, blah, blah. Um, did I hear a beep on the, um, was somebody wanting to speak on? Um, Peggy, did you have something you wanted to add? Can you unmute her? No, okay. Um, is she going to unmute? I don't know. It looks like maybe she's typing. Oh, she, she typed She had something before that said that she was having issues with her. <coughs> Well, if you want to type something in, feel free. My, uh, and this is obviously a volatile issue, and I understand because I also have a, a, a daughter in school, so I understand Chris's frustration with the uh, personal part of it. Um, my question is, uh, in terms of this, do we have a, a responsibility to our constituency to give them what they're asking for? And in my experience so far, being elected to this board, I have found that people would like this to happen. <clears throat> so I'm, while I am in agreement with the statement, and this is more where my feelings lie, this is also my uh, I feel my duty to my constituency as I've been asked to uh, do something of this sort. So, you know, beyond the personal, I feel that this is my duty as a member of this board because the people that elected me asked for this. So uh, that's why, another reason why I provided it. Um, well, I guess at this point, um, I, we can entertain a motion either to approve it as written or to amend it or... I have a motion to approve as written. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. Um, is there any further discussion on the motion? 
I would prefer to see an amendment. Uh, I like I like the statement. I don't disagree with it, but I would like to see it uh, include more students. Okay. Um, I mean, I think at this point, if you have wording that you would like to make a motion to amend it with, then we can do that. Otherwise, um, I would like to see an amendment at the beginning. Okay. Um, you know, I think if there's a sp something specific that you want to have, like we can, like there's a motion on the floor, so we can amend the motion to amend the wording if we have wording to be done. Or, um, you know, like how, how would you amend it? Really? <clears throat> what about at the beginning, if I may, something to the effect of uh, given the understanding that we respect all students' rights and everyone has a right to a safe and inclusive environment. And the White River Unified School Board understands that LGBTQIA students, and then pretty much as is with the amendment at the beginning, addressing that we acknowledge that all students uh, deserve a safe and inclusive place to go to school. Yeah. Well, we have that, that the Declaration of Inclusion provides that. But this provides something more. Or, or we can, we could. That's uh, why there's a, a bridge dic a dictionary and an unabridged dictionary. This, this provides something in excess of our statement that we need to address because of certain issues with this community. Or, or we could, we could approve this statement, mm -hmm. and then at the next meeting we could approve another statement that encompasses the rest of the student body. I look at that. I'm that telling time. you with all honesty, Chris. I, I will approve any statement that protects any student. And we could do 10 of these. For, that, that, that's not my problem. Doing more of these isn't my problem. We, we want to do, do one for uh, kids of color. We want to do one for female students. We can, we can address this over and over and make the most protections and statements. And really, this is a statement of support. So all it is is us coming out publicly and saying, hey, we're with you guys. We understand. We see you. And I'll do that for any kid in the school system, any statement, any time. You write it up and we'll at least talk it through. And just like this one got cut down from the, the larger one uh, in the fall, we will get it passed. Any statement that protects any kid in any way. And I'd be more than happy to do that. I'll, uh, you and I can meet and, and do that. Like we could, I'll work together with you, especially if we can pass this tonight. <clears throat> I, I'm all for it. I'd be more than happy to sit down and write other ones. That, 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 and, and I, so I, I mean it. Sure we could we could go and we could sit down and we could craft uh, another policy. No problem. But I'd like I'd like to pass this tonight very much. Okay. Um, so, does anybody want to make a motion to amend the language or? Can you read that, Ray? Yeah. <clears throat> Possible wording. The WRUSB school board, I'm guessing, firmly believes that all students, regardless of, need to be educated in a caring and nurturing environment, then continue the document we have. Regardless of being regardless of sexual orientation and gender. Okay. Why don't we just get rid of the, would it be okay to get rid of the regardless of instead of just the... I mean, if you take the regardless of, it sounds uh, similar to what I was proposing, and I'm, right. I, yeah. So, so I'm, I'm fine either way. We, we either put an introductory sentence like that, or do another... Well, I mean, it's, you can do both. Like. Statement. I, 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 what way, whatever is easier, well, not easiest, but whatever, whatever is best. Um, I like the idea of the introductory statement without the regardless. Because, you know, I think kind of.
pointing out that like we want to like the goal is to support all of our students. And, right. You know, this is addressing one segment of all of those students, but we want to support all of our students. Right. And I so, like the statement. Yeah. And, and I just would like to be a little more inclusive, I guess. Or, yeah. No. And I think um, I think that this having that introductory sentence is a good way of saying that that's the goal. It's not like okay. to single out anybody. It's to if uh, somebody wants to break that, I'm not. I'm doing it now. Yeah. Okay. So, we need a motion to amend the motion. I make a motion to amend the motion. With, or amend the statement. Oh, second. I'm sorry. Well, why don't you read the, how the statement is. Okay. It, it will read. I'm sorry. I'm still writing, too. The White River Unified District School Board firmly believes that all students need to be educated in a caring and nurturing environment, then continue, oh, I'm sorry. And stop there. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, and I was reading Peggy's words. Yeah, and then, and then after environment, uh, as written. The statement as written after, uh, after nurturing environment. <clears throat> So has that's been moved and seconded at this point? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we'll vote on, unless there's, is there any discussion on the amendment to the motion? Um, go ahead, Tammy. Can you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> it's what's written in, uh, in Peggy's comment, but without the regardless of. Okay, so the White River Unified District School Board firmly believes that all students, regardless, oh, no. I'm sorry, um, firmly believes that all students need to be educated in a caring and nurturing environment. Period. Yep. Okay, got it. I just, um, the interrupted sentences or disjointedness was causing sure. confusion yeah, in my no mind. Problem. Thank Sorry. you. Thanks for clarifying. All right, so we have an amendment to the motion, a motion to amend the motion on the table. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, Peggy, can you give us a thumbs up or a... Okay, good, thank you. Um, oh yeah, why don't you type aye into the chat <laughs> in the future. Probably <laughs> the um, okay, so now the we have the amended Thanks, statements right. up for a vote. Um, I think we'll call the question at this point. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? <laughs> Next, Peggy. All right, the statement of support passes. And thank you guys for working through that and coming to a productive place in the end. Was to talk through it. Okay, so we'll move on to the school district population projections. So you have your uh, the population projections in your packet. Uh, this was provided to us by the we joined uh, for the first time since I've been superintendent with the New England School Development Council. Um, and part of why we, we joined that was to provide population projections for all of our districts, but also some special ed um, data analysis for us, um, historical, um, and then some uh, projections in that regards, which will continue to be used uh, for budgeting purposes. But um, so what you have here is the White River Unified District uh, historical data. They um, did use um, census data from 2020 to also um, fill out their algorithm for population projections. They've told us that their standard deviation will um, get smaller by the more that they do this over time. Um, and so this is their first time working with us as an organization. We'll continue to work with them annually. Um, and so what you can see here um, in regards to their cover sheet um, is that that you know enrollment in in general across the SU 
appears to be stabilizing versus what we've saw in regards to de decreased enrollment prior to now, um, which is good. The, you know, the, I think the tricky thing for our district in general, um, which this does, doesn't necessarily take into account, but I think it's important for folks to know is, is that, you know, as we continue to work on recruitment activities and things of that nature, we could have way more bodies than what they're able to account for necessarily right now in our actual buildings. Mm -hmm. Right, so make certain that you understand that that's not necessarily being taken into account um, with these projections. Currently, we have some capacity where we can fit those bodies. In. Yes, yeah, and that's what we're working on. So, um, my question on this is just: I'd be curious to know what their projections for other towns around the state are, just since it, our area diverges so much from the state average projection, um, you know, that's down 10% over the next 10 years or eight years mm -hmm. or whatever. So, you know, do they see the same, it, it, are there, are they projecting that sort of decline elsewhere, but not in our district or, you know, do you know what I'm trying to say? I do, like, yeah. No, I'm happy to reach out. We'll ask that question. Uh, you mean? Where is the state losing students that we are? Right. In, you know, in terms of that temperature. Yes. Like why, why are we exempt from the state trend? <laughs> and, you know, if they are looking at the birth rates and, and it happens to be that our, or whatever, our population projection is different for our area, that, that makes sense. But, <coughs> that's kind of a... <laughs> um, methodology or something that yeah no I think it's worthwhile yeah. um, does anybody have any other comments or questions about the uh, projections mm -hmm. didn't you say at the the full board meeting Jamie didn't didn't you say how small the deviation was going to get I they didn't provide us they with didn't that. okay. They just said that they would, they would get tighter. It'd get much tighter. I remember you saying that, but I didn't remember if you would set a number when we were sitting there, like that it's going to get this much better, expected to be this much better per. Given, you know, we saw a pretty big dip in enrollment due to outside factors that certainly aren't going to be factored into this. So, you know, it's good to see that general lie of the land, but we just have to see what happens. All right, um, moving on, we'll, we've done the two action items already as part of the discussion, um, and we're on to public comment. Is there any public comment? Okay, then are there Hi. Oh, hi. hi. Um, just for clarification, what is the board's intended difference between the declaration of inclusion and the statement of support that was just amended? It is rather unclear as to the differentiation between the two, and I'm just trying to understand the board's intended difference between the two. Do you want to speak on that, Ed? <clears throat> For the new one, uh, <clears throat> as a member of the constituency, I sat through the, the meetings in the fall and uh, was subject to listening to the other statement and, and being involved in that as a, a public participant. This one is to, to be in place of that one because that one wasn't agreed upon. And the part that I was actually in agreement with Chris about was providing some, some facts to back it up that say this population is in fact protected and this population is in fact in danger. So they, they are in fact protected because of the, I put in the SCOTUS uh, ruling and the, and the Vermont. The Trevor Project is the linchpin upon which uh, really the proof of this is that this, this population needs uh, critical support, at least publicly, in that these kids are in fact 
uh, provably higher rate for suicide and higher rate for, for many other horrible things that are happening in their life and uh, at least one third of them can't even speak about it in their own homes. So this statement is to guide us in our principles specifically for that community and how that and now that we've added that amendment it's how that community interacts with everyone else around them because we've uh, we put all students in several times so now that actually has us coming and going this is how this community relates to all the other students and how all the other students relate to this community as a uh, community that has some additional difficulties and so the statement of support, I hear your words specifically on the statement of support, support that was discussed this evening. Um, so back to the question, what is the board's intended difference between the declaration of inclusion and that statement of support? So while your answer focused on the statement of support, um, can you talk about the declaration of inclusion then? On I, what the intended difference between the two is? I can't because I didn't pass the declaration of inclusion. So I think it would probably be... The Declaration of Inclusion was passed, I thought, within last the month. past... Was, yeah. was that so me last time? Did you guys... Yeah. School board meetings. Um, so, you know, I think it's just the Declaration of Inclusion is a broad statement that encompasses everybody and, you know, says that we are against, you know, discrimination in all forms and all that. And whereas this was a statement of support of a subset that is facing specific challenges. Thank you. No further questions. Okay. All right. Um, new buyer's resignation. I, I actually have sure. a couple of comments. Mm -hmm. So I, I have some questions for the board members, and feel free to answer it if you want, or you can stay silent. Um, I know we, we have a lot of policies and, 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 and things, and we, we claim that we're upholding uh, different things so I guess just in our everyday lives if we were to see something happen or read about something that was bullying or harassment or discriminatory would would you stop say something do something about that in general in your own lives that's right often yeah yeah do you believe that that it's always, you know, left or right, yes or no? Do you believe that sometimes you can be in favor of something, but maybe not move forward with it because of maybe the way it, it might uh, interact with another policy or precedence that it might? I think some set? things are, but I, I can tell you decisively that I believe some things are absolutes. Yeah. There are some things in this life that are absolutes. But do you believe it <coughs> just because you're not for or against? an item that you, you know, just because no, you didn't no, say no, yes or no, that you say. could, yes. that you're anti or you're, or you're pro something. No, I, I know if, where you're going with that. If, yes. if I didn't believe what you were insinuating, I wouldn't be able to sit on this board with you. That okay. sometimes that there's slight nuances to every issue. I wouldn't be able to sit here and even have gone through what we went through if I didn't believe that there's nuances to issues mm -hmm. and that it's not all or nothing. <clears throat> so I, I'm glad <laughs> I'm glad that you guys all said that because because did you know that and, and I know you know because there's several of the board members that are part of this that there's a community forum in Royalton that there was posts about myself that were put on that that were definitely bullying harassment misinformation I have it all printed out here uh, our ex-board member is actually the person that put this up, and she put it up while she was still on the board. Um, I know that there's two people on this board right now that are members of that group, and mm -hmm. I do know that, and I do know that one person that's on the board right now is good friends with the other administrator of that group. And, and I guess after you just sat here and said that if you saw bullying or harassment or discrimination, or miss, you know, things like that, that you would stand up and you would say, that's not right. What are you doing? Now, I will want to thank, there's one member of our society that was able to do that and exclude them from that, but why did you guys not do that? 
I think at this point, your conflict with that one individual has become very personal. And additionally, I don't engage on social media even a fraction as much as I used to because I was chased off of social media by <clears throat> certain parties and actually had to uh, leave multiple groups because of a similar thing to what you're talking about where I was just harassed into the dirt and that was not when I was a board member. That was when I was a personal member of the community. I was being raked over the coals and Honestly, you're talking about the one I I know I think I know what you're talking about, but um, oh, I'm sure you know what you're talking about. Your ex-wife put on Facebook, listen, and I provided with, with I provided with that she called the Vermont State Police on me. Listen to me. That's, so I, I don't what I'm want saying to. Is you just sat here and said that if you did see bullying and harassment, that you would stand your ground and say something. <laughs> Bullying is when somebody can't stick up for themselves. I think you can stick up for yourself against how do I, that one how do I person. I stick up for myself on a, a forum that is that is uh, private, that you have to be a member of, um, that I'm being discriminated just because um, I might take a stance. It doesn't mean that I'm anti. Just I'm not anti LGBTQ just because I don't vote in a resolution. That's that's crap. I have so many friends of mine that fit into that group. Just like I have friends of mine that are are different color, different race, different religion. Um, it, it, it's disgusting, the things that were put on this site. And knowing that two of you are sitting right here that didn't have the courtesy to say, hey, you know what? Isn't this site, because the site's supposed to be about, if you read through the, it's supposed to, it, it says, South Royalton billboard, uh, no bigots or something like that. And then if you read the rules, it's about, uh, a non-harassing space where we can all get together and, and talk, but there's this garbage on it. Right. And, you know, and let me finish. Yeah. And, and if, if you've ever been attacked like that, you would think that you would separate yourself from groups like that, right? So, and you said, I, 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 would, I would avoid that conflict and I wouldn't be a part of that group. But, but you're a member of that group, you know? Now, now I would say, that if I, which I'm not a member of a lot of groups, if I was a member of a group and I saw somebody say something about Rodney, if I thought it was right or wrong, I would say, hey, you know what? This is probably not the right forum to be talking about stuff like that. Per the person can't defend themselves or whatever. And I would excuse myself and make a statement. But again, this goes to, you know, kind of the board of conduct. We are, in the public's eyes, at all times, we are board members. We don't get to take the hat off for five minutes. So if you're on a site where one of your board members is being trashed by a lot of misinformation bullcrap, and none of you stand up to say, wait a minute, this isn't right. Or, or you know what, if this is okay. going on, I'm going to have to recuse myself. Then you're violating this, this board of conduct that we're already passed. And you saw uh, people on this board on, guys, in that thread. Guys, let's not get into a back and forth. Let's so I'm there just saying, back and forth. I'm just back. saying we, no we preach uh, a lot of at things. At the point of personal privilege, I believe the three minutes that the public speaker uh, had okay. is up, and I would I'd like to make a public comment. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. I graduated from what was South Royalton High School in 1992. It was a classmate of mine who had to go to the school board to get permission to put a gay cartoon in the yearbook. I also knew somebody who took a uh, same-sex partner to uh, the prom in the 2000s. And at the time, that was a really big deal. And I would just like to say that this too will pass. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, history will be on the correct side. Thank you. Um, okay, I think you made your point. We can, I'm happy to discuss with you personally. Um, anyway, we move on. Is there any other public comments? Um, new hires and resignations? I've got, I have a Melissa 
Kathleen who's been hired for elementary. Uh, she is coming from Boston. Has local roots here uh, related to Miss Franny Staples, so we're thankful for that. So we're excited to welcome her. Uh, and the I'm gonna say Dan. We're hiring Dan. Yeah. Um, no, I was a start with yeah, I could say I'm sorry. <laughs> Dan Morrison, who's been serving as a long time. I was thinking, is there somebody I don't know about? Yeah, that that was a, to me I don't know. I didn't get the like, seal of approval good. that that was. Yeah. We're good. Hiring Dan Morrison, also, who's been serving as a long term substitute covering Jess uh, Gordon's leave while she's been out. So he's lovely and wonderful and really wants to be here because it feels like a great community to teach in. So happy to invite him to the Red community. We're not exactly certain of everyone's exact. Uh, assignments Simon. yet, but to be determined. So those are the two hires that are real. <laughs> and I'm still working. How many more positions do we need to fill? We don't know yet because contracts haven't been returned yet. We're currently uh, engaging in interviews with librarians right now, is, is one, one thing I'm working on right now. Um, we do know we have a paraprofessional position open. Um, so yeah, to be determined, not exactly certain. Yeah, the high school has a part-time social studies that they're trying to fill, um, and um, we're filling the high school PE position. It may have been a couple months back, but weren't we trying to fill a foreign language? That's also that's still that's, that's still that's not my job. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I wasn't. No, no, I just remembered. Yeah. I remembered from a previous that we had. No, I, I'm just kind of wondering if yeah. we're in good shape or you know, we kind of. I feel like I feel like this is a year of people relocating closer to home. Honestly, I don't think anyone's leaving because they're like super dissatisfied, but they're having opportunities closer to home. It's really the librarian had a baby and she was closer to the Shelburne area and she was down in Shelburne. So, um, so we'll know more soon. I think everyone's dealing and dealing right now. No, I would say we're in a much better place than we have in previous years yeah. at this moment in time. Good. Good. You know, with the labor shortages and everything, so I don't worry about that. Okay. Uh, we don't have any others, so future agenda items, uh, the expansion project update, and a discussion on athletics that could be strategic planning. You get your uh, track my progress um, data report it is in May for academic data. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our next meeting date is Tuesday, May 16th at 6.30 at the Royalton campus. And motion to adjourn. <coughs> motion to adjourn. Seconded.